Welcome everyone. See, we still have some people arriving. So thank you for being here. We'll give it just a moment before we formally begin the program. Thank you all for being here and for um, giving us your time this evening. So thank you again. Thank you all for being here for this very special presentation. My name is Katie Porter and I am executive director of Inlandia Institute. We are a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in inland Southern California and serving the entire region. Tonight's program is learning from the Harada story and it is presented in partnership with the Museum of Riverside and the Harada House Foundation. Here on behalf of the Harada House Foundation is Sarah Mundy to say just a few words um, about their mission. Uh, thank you, Katie. I, um, for those of you unfamiliar with the foundation, our goal is to ensure the story of the Harada family struggle for civil rights is shared, remembered, and learned from, and to generate support financially and otherwise from public and private donors in order to further our purpose, which is to rehabilitate the family house, a national historic landmark. Obviously, tonight's program is in line with our mission. We believe it is critical to connect the dots between civil rights issues from the past to the present, and I hope you find tonight's program engaging and informative. Thank you for enjoying and joining us. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, as you might have noticed, this event is in view only mode. So you can listen and you can watch, um, but we will not have any um, speaking or spoken questions this evening. If you uh, do have a question, we encourage you to drop it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, there is uh, no chat tonight. Uh, we want to keep the focus on the program and we do encourage you to please um, leave your questions and we will get to them toward the end of our event. This, we also would like to let you know that this program is being recorded um, both by Inlandia Institute and by the City of Riverside. So you may watch it again later at your leisure. And we have a slate of distinguished guests with us this evening. But before we begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kawiya, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So now I would like to introduce our moderator, the Museum of Riverside Director, Dr. Robin Peterson, who has had a decades long career in museum management and curatorial work. So welcome Robin and thank you for being here. Thank you, Katie. On behalf of the Museum of Riverside, I thank our panelists and our audience members for being with us this evening. We've prepared a handful of questions that our panelists have had an opportunity to consider in advance. We'll spend a few minutes on each and all panelists are encouraged to respond to any and all in a conversational manner. Lauren Weiss-Bricker, Vice President of the Harada House Foundation will be monitoring the audience Q&A and as noted, we'll take audience questions at the end. Uh, this past summer, the Museum of Riverside was fortunate to have been awarded a $500,000 Save America's Treasures grant, which is administered by the National Park Service. The grant enables us to begin the multi-year project of rehabilitating Harada House, but it does require a one-to-one -one match, and you can help by donating to this effort and spreading the word about this nationally important historic site. So, Katie, I will ask if you will share your screen again so we can introduce our panelists. Sure. 
Jack Clark is an attorney with the firm of Best Best and Krieger and has been for over 30 years. He's engaged in public agency litigation practice and has been involved in multiple matters that concern diversity and inclusion in his law practice within the community. Larry Gonzalez was just named City of Riverside Chief of Police this year and has served in the Riverside Police Department for nearly three decades. He's been an instructor at the Riverside Sheriff's Academy for over 20 years, specializing in use of force, laws of arrest, defensive tactics, and civil liability. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Workforce Education and Development from Southern Illinois University and is a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Kristen Hayashi is a public historian and director of collections management and access and curator at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. She earned a PhD in MA in history from the University of California, Riverside. Her dissertation research examined the return and resettlement of Japanese Americans in post-World War II Los Angeles. Michelle Magalon, PhD, is a presidential postdoctoral fellow in historic preservation at the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at the University of Maryland. Her research on social justice, community participation, and historic preservation in Asian American and Pacific Islander communities is drawn from her practitioner work as president of the Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. She received her MA and PhD in urban planning from UCLA. And myself. <laughs> so without further ado, we will go into our questions. And um, I will start by asking and ask if Jack Clark will ad address this one first. For the past 400 years, the value of democratic systems has been troublingly and persistently questioned. The pain of current events since May 2020 has brought this to the fore again. Is this moment today different? And what potential do you see for affecting positive change within existing systems? So I would, um, well, first of all, thank you for asking me to be part of this. Um, I, I think what Inlandia does is, is terrific for the community, and I, I'm honored to be um, asked to serve on such a distinguished panel. Um, in terms of um, the question, I would start with focusing on what do you mean by existing systems? If you're talking about um, our state and federal systems, um, our court systems, our, our systems of local government. Um, I believe positive change is um, certainly um, available using our existing systems. From my perspective, whatever system you set up, um, the operative ingredient is gonna be human beings. And um, in that regard, I think we've identified in the recent events um, starting um, certainly in May and through the summer, um, I think at least I have come to the realization that my hope, even from my childhood, that we would become more understanding, more tolerant, um, more loving of each other. If we just increased education, if we worked on ignorance, um, we have a society now that is um, certainly has access to public education multiple um, opportunities for higher education through community colleges, universities, colleges. And yet we see it time and again that um, there is this persistent, nasty tendency of human beings to categorize other human beings based upon things that are irrelevant, things like race, gender, sexual orientation. Um, and so in my view, um, the institutions were created with a proper idea. I think we're to a point, even though we've, we've been able to elect an African-American president, we're to a point of, of realizing that the significant changes are going to have to be on some basic elemental levels of how we deal with each other. And there are things that I see existing right now that are severely in the way. I think this, um, this counterculture phenomenon is, or excuse me, cancel culture phenomenon is, is extremely corrosive to a society. 
the idea that if you somewhere put out into the universe something that was even hateful, that you will be essentially expelled from the community forevermore because of that. Um, I think that dynamic, um, we need to stop that. Um, I could go on, but we have um, other panelists and we have only about eight minutes per, per question. So I'll stop there, but I, I do believe that um, some progress can be made, but I think we're at the place where it's not going to, to the extent it's been hard in the past, it's going to be much, much more difficult in the future. Would other panelists like to weigh in on that? Again, considering what, what might be meant by existing systems. I could, I could jump in there on that one, Robin. And uh, like Jax was saying, it's an absolute honor to be a panelist um, tonight and thank you for inviting me. For us, from a law enforcement perspective, um, like Jack was saying, um, educational. So educational for law enforcement is training and increasing the amount of training and the type of training is very important. So, um, and, and we've said this before, as long as we hire from the human race, we're gonna have, we're going to have issues, but we, we can address a lot of those through our training and it doesn't, it, it shouldn't be too little too late it should be stuff that starts off in the basic police academy for our recruits. And it is starting to make its way in there. And then us um, taking it to the next level. And that's why we have training in our departments now, such as procedural justice or implicit bias training, which was non-existent five years ago. Um, so I think that's a huge part is educating our officers, educating um, the up and coming officers and also the ones that have been here for a while. That's probably um, I would say a, a tougher audience for us to capture, but definitely doable. So it's, it's, it's all about training and educating um, our officers when it comes uh, to this topic. Other panelists? Yeah, I wonder if I might jump in. Um, you know, I, I'm so inspired to see that so many individuals um, and, and grassroots groups are standing up for um, those who are vulnerable and whose civil liberties are under threat. And just thinking back historically, you know, there were very few people who stood up for the Harada family, you know, when they attempted to navigate legal discrimination um, that, you know, intended to um, hamper their social mobility. And, and then once again, later on, um, very few people stood up for the Harada family and other Japanese American families when they were forcibly removed from their homes and communities um, and sub subsequently incarcerated during World War II. Um, in America's concentration camps. So I think there's also been a shift in um, the mindset of political leaders and even in Californians. And I think this is something that's, that's somewhat new. You know, again, historically, there've been political leaders who ran on platforms um, to keep California white or were complicit in enforcing legal discrimination that furthered um, inequality. And I'm just thinking about James uh, Phelan, for example, who was um, mayor of San Francisco before he ran for, um, U.S. Senate seat from California in 1914. And that's just a year before the Haradas tried to buy their house. And he ran on an open platform that promised to keep California white. And I'm thinking about um, um, Frank C. Jordan, who was the California Secretary of State from 1911 to 1940. And you know, he, was, he was adamant at enforcing the 1913 California alien land law. And then you know, Earl Warren, who was um, the Attorney General and then the governor of California and very complicit um, in the forced removal of Japanese um, from the West Coast. So I think, you know, we've come a long way from that historical moment. And I just think that this is like a reminder, this current moment is a reminder that all of us have this responsibility to uphold, you know, America's promise. So you feel like it, this recent months really is kind of a sea change in the way people are reacting? I'm hopeful. <laughs> Michelle, do you have a yeah, and I want to build upon what Kristen is saying in terms of engagement, right? Um, it's a time for, for um, us to start to capture the moment where um, our voices matter and that we can engage in these existing systems if they're political systems, right? Um, um, as, as we saw just earlier this month that like our voices do matter um, and that there's, and we have, um, protections in place to make sure that our voices are heard and counted, um, you know, and so I think it's really this moment um, that's been building up in particular this year of where people feel like, you know, it's time to, to speak up and speak out, um, but even take it to the next step and, and um, participate in these processes, right? Um, 
And so um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time to see, like, how do we get involved, whatever that may be, if that's in our workplace, um, in, um, in political, you know, systems, or what, even in our own families of how do we talk about um, things that um, the historical legacies of these um, against our civil liberties um, and, and discrimination. Thank you. Can I add one point? Sure. I want to be clear. Um, when I'm talking about can change occur within existing systems, I'm talking about the systems as they were created theoretically. And by that I mean that it was intended to diffuse power. So you would not have accumulate, you wouldn't have one person um, or a group of people um, who have um, an ethical, immoral, views of other human beings get into a position where they could dictate. It, it, I, I would, it would be naive of me, I mean, beyond naive, excuse me, of me to, um, to assert that if the status quo is allowed to stay, um, that would be sufficient. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we have to put pressure on the existing systems to operate as they were intended to. To, to give effect to simple terms like equal protection under the law, that all human beings are created equal. We, 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 those words were written, but we never acted upon that. And so when I'm saying, can the existing system function? I'm saying, yes, if we make some fundamental changes in, and require fundamental changes of the way we interact between each other. And that includes, um, holding the existing systems accountable. For example, the Riverside PD. The Riverside PD has to be fully engaged with the community that it serves. And there cannot be a sense, I'm using PD as an example, um, there cannot be a sense of, to, of, of any um, system that we've created to say, you created us, we're populating this now, now leave us alone. There has to be absolute transparency as much as we can possibly do that and yet protect the rights of the individuals. But, at, but, but I wanna be clear that I am not saying the status quo is any way um, acceptable. Yes, point taken. Uh, we do need to get out the next question, but Larry, do you wanna pop in quickly on that one? Uh, just, just briefly, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Jack's saying and, and you know, I don't know if we'll get it. We've had incidents in our in our past, and if we talked about all of them, we wouldn't get off the call tonight. But uh, uh, the engagement with our community was a key factor um, on why we had troubles in the past. Those were not established relationships. And we've worked very hard and diligently the last 22 years to have those relationships because uh, we can't function without the trust of our community. So I'll leave it at that. I know we got to get on to the next question. Oh. So. And, and I will, Larry, ask you to address this one first. So Jukichi Harada had purchased property prior to deeding the house on Lemon Street in the names of his American-born children. Yet in this white neighborhood, an action to enforce unjust legislation was triggered. So would you be willing to comment on the differential enforcement of the law and the role of enforcement in interpreting law? How can compliance and enforcement of the law be conducted equitably? Well, that's the key word is equitably. And um, if, if I'm training our guys the right way, then they will enforce the law properly and equitably. We don't get to choose on who we arrest. And just a quick example, somebody robs a liquor store. We look for a suspect, we will arrest him. I think what people um, talk about a little bit more is probably the inequities that go on through the judicial system after that arrest is made. And I can't necessarily comment on that specifically, but uh, an officer does his job there or her job there, they get booked and then they go to the system. And sometimes there's questions about what happens once they get into the system, you know, uh, whether what it was their sentence or whether, um, you know, what happened to that person after were they given resources they needed, whether it was diversion or incarceration. Um, so I, I think what I hear a lot anyway, is uh, some of the inequities that, that happen throughout the system, not so much on us targeting certain individuals or treating somebody different when a crime is committed. So, and of course, historically in this, in this context, it was actually um, 
the system that chose to enforce a law in this case when it had not enforced it in other neighborhoods. So do, do any of the other panelists have any comment on this, this role of law enforcement and the system in inequitably applying? Rob, I'm sorry, can I just add one last thing when we're talking about that as far as directed enforcement and types of enforcement? I'm not saying officers don't have discretion. So I'll, I'll use COVID as an example. Uh, there are certain laws that have come out or ordinances that have come out or orders that have come out from the state to the county to the city that officers have discretion on on um, whether they enforce or not, such as wearing a mask or a business that's opening when they shouldn't be open. Um, and, and they do have that discretionary role. However, it should never be based on gender, race, religious beliefs, things like that. Other panels like to weigh on in on this question? Again, the role of law enforcement in interpreting law is what it's kind of about. So I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just state this. Um, this is something that we, we have to engage. And, and throughout the history of the country, unfortunately, um, one of the primary tools that was used to deny people civil rights, the right to vote, the right to assemble, um, the right to um, petition the government. Um, the primary agency um, that was used by um, a racist system was the police department. They were the tip of the spear. And so um, it seems to me that um, as, and, and, and the, and I'm not, I keep going back to the, the, um, the common denominator is the, whatever these mechanisms are within human beings that allow us to treat people horribly for irrelevant reasons. And, and I go back to the, the woman in the park in New York who being asked to simply change, um, leash her dog threatens an African-American man with calling the what? The police. And, and the reason that left such a deep imprint in my mind was she made it a point to tell the dispatcher that her, uh, her attacker was African-American. She knew that that bit of information would carry more weight than simply a man is attacking me. And so um, I, I appreciate um, Chief Gonzalez's um, point about implicit bias. And, and I would, I, I, I'm, I'm going to challenge him though, and I do respect him, but I'm going to challenge him though that I think we have to be clear that we cannot simply allow the fact that we trained or we brought a group in or we brought a consultant in. We have to set up safe spaces to have very hard conversations about who we are as human beings and what we want out of our police force. And, and be willing to have an existing system that we're willing to be to at least consider reimagining, restructuring. Because there are aspects of the police department we always need. But I, I question as it's grown in response to real world threats, undeniable real world threats, has it grown in a way that was necessary or did it simply respond and stay that way? So my point is we need to engage each other. We need to question. And with regard to this issue of um, differential enforcement of laws, um, there are organizations all over the country that believe that happens. Um, and unfortunately, that incident in New York is an example um, that the community almost invites it sometimes. Thank you. Any other panelists uh, uh, would like to weigh in on this before we move to the next question? All right. Kristen, I'll ask you to address this one first. Uh, what is the impact of historic preservation on communities of color 
from education to social justice to civic engagement to other arenas? And what difference can preservation of historic sites make for our communities? Why does it matter that historic sites be recognized? Sure. Um, you know, well, ultimately, I'll say that I think representation and, and recognition at the places that matter to our communities um, are, you know, upheld and revered in the same way as, as cultural treasures like you know, the Statue of Liberty or the White House, I think is really meaningful and important. And um, I think that a landmark designation, you know, is validation that these, these places matter and that these stories are important. Um, I do think that preservation takes, you know, multiple forms. Um, in the case of the Harada House, in addition to the, the National um, Historic Landmark status and the National Register and all the local designations, you know, there are other ways that you're preserving the family's history, whether it's through like Mark Raj's book, or, you know, the Harada family's collection, which is at the Museum of Riverside. I think there are multiple ways, you know, that you are preserving the story. But I think when you are talking about, uh, specifically about landmarks, historic landmarks, I do think that they're important. You know, historic landmarks become these touchstones um, to these important stories. And that plaque that's outside of the Harada house is so important because if it wasn't there, I think people would have the tendency to walk by and not know you know, the story, this really impressive and amazing um, social justice story that is hinged to that, to that house. So I do think that it helps to build awareness and, um, and, you know, helps people to understand um, the important history that takes place at some of these sites. So um, I also think that, you know, the preservation work that Michelle and, and, you know, so many of our colleagues are doing really is social justice work. Um, and that's partly because, you know, there, there's such a disparity in the number of sites that represent not only Japanese American um, experiences and contributions, but other, you know, um, mar historically marginalized communities. So um, while there's such a disparity in sites, I do feel um, that, like, you know, the Harada House is like this, this shining beacon um, that, uh, that we all, you know, are so proud of, so. Michelle, might you? Yeah, I mean, I'm building upon uh, Kristen's um, remarks, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, tuning in from Washington, D.C. tonight, but uh, actually lived um, in inland Southern California before that um, in Corona and in Redlands, and also was um, a staff member at UC Riverside. And during my time living in the inland Southern California, uh, the Harada House is a place that was really important to just even visit, right? Um, knowing that like in Riverside and the surrounding region, um, there aren't many uh, historic places or as many, you know, that are national historic landmarks. There's only three in the region. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and really just highlighting the history of, of the region is something that we haven't really, you know, elevated even that, not just of an Asian American story, but even, you know, um, the stories of, of, of the um, inland Southern California um, and that the Harada house can be a place for when people come, you know, they're gonna see a house and say, what is this house, right? It's not um, the Statue of Liberty, it's not the White House, but rather um, how can an ordinary building, ordinary building, be of such importance. And it gives us a moment to really, um, to take a pause, to look at the, the markers, um, to even go online and see content that's been written about the Harada family and the house itself. And, you know, I know there was a period of time where I was fortunate to, to actually go inside the Harada house and just um, see uh, what, you know, the family's, you know, life was like and how that was, it became very personal. It became this moment where you can feel um, that you're, you know, you're in their, in, in their footsteps, in their legacy. And I think it's very powerful for folks, you know, regardless of age, gender, anything that you come into that place and you want to understand what that, the stories are there. So I think it's amazing to see what historic preservation looks like in terms of saving the house, saving the building, and that, you know, it's an ongoing issue as we know that we're, you know, with the Save America's Treasure Grant of trying to um, rehabilitate it. But it's also, um, you know, other ways of historic preservation through public education, social media, um, you know, partnerships with the museum and, you know, and the foundation. Um, and so, you know, 
oftentimes in historic preservation, you think about saving a building. And, you know, many times it's not just about the building and the plaque as much as it's worthy, but it's about the people that continue to carry the legacy um, and to build upon it and to also build connections to what is the, the historical narrative, um, its significance of that building or that place and tie it to what's happening, you know, um, to us today. Um, you know, as we talk about today, like in, in our discussion, um, how do we use the Harada House as a touchstone to have other conversations and, and, and draw on its relevancy? Would you say that these, um, the historic preservation in these communities of color or, or relating to sites um, for different racial groups who are not necessarily see, uh, seen their sites preserved so avidly has more importance or a different kind of importance than it does, for instance, than saving yet another grand mansion? Um, well, I mean, it's funny you bring up the grand mansion, right? Um, in the sense of like these these very grand buildings by by notable architects. That's what we know, right? Or that's what's traditionally been known for historic preservation um, on local, state, and uh, federal levels. But I think it's a moment where you know, and I know per, uh, personally, um, being um, Filipino American, people say, you know, like where is your place? Where is your history? Where do we see that? Um, and, you know, and I often say, well, you know, uh, just like Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, and other uh, people of color, we were not allowed to own land for, for, for a really long time, right? And so if, how can we save a place when we couldn't own it, we couldn't uh, inhabit it, we couldn't even be seen, right? Um, as we see, you know, with folks who maybe from the LGBT community, just like we were hidden, we were invisible. Um, we were prohibited to occupy space historically, right? And so how can you save a place or even claim a place when we were not allowed to even, you know, legally? Um, and so I think the places that we see uh, that are being preserved that is associated with, you know, underrepresented groups, they may seem to look ordinary, run down, or even, you know, not noteworthy. Um, so I think it, but we're, we're flipping that script and saying, no, it doesn't matter about the architecture so much so as it's um, the historical contributions of notable people, notable places, um, notable, um, you know, events. And so really, how do you broaden the interpretation of historic preservation is key. Um, and I think that's a way to address, I mean, as, as Kristen had mentioned, there's a huge disparity. Um, in terms of representation of uh, landmarks on the national level, it's less than 8% um, for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and LGBTQ history. Um, and so we, and then even for Asian Americans, it's less than 1% uh, uh, re represented on the national level. Um, and so there are disparities, but I think that these are moments like the Harada House, I guess, it, it inspires us to continue to do the work right, and that the work isn't done. Um, there's actually a lot more to be done, um, but it, it gives us, it shows us an example of the, you know, many generations of um, are needed to, to kind of do this uh, historic preservation work. Kristen or other panelists, do you want to weigh in on this one? Okay, okay we'll move on to the next question. And, um, Jack or Larry, either one can respond on this one first, please. Reflecting on the federal responses to recent peaceful protests that have been managed at the local level, please comment on authoritarian actions that are interpreted by many observers as jeopardizing First Amendment rights. I guess I can start, Jack, since I've talked an awful lot about protests the last couple months. and. Um, at the local level, you know, our sole response, our number one priority is to ensure that our citizens can exercise their First Amendment rights safely. That's what our object, uh, yeah, that's our objective when we go out. And each, each agency is a little bit different than others, you know, as far as the local, the sheriffs might do it a little different than we do, how we police it. At Riverside PD, we, we have the most protests in the entire county because we are the county seat. We are the loudest, we are the uh, largest agency in there. And we're more of a stay in the shadows type agency when we police. We're, we're gonna stand back, 
we're going to be in parking structures, we're going to observe with drones or whatever from a distance, <clears throat> just to ensure that they're able to exercise their First Amendment rights safely. Um, we, uh, and just, I mean, for the folks that do live in Riverside, we, up until the election, we had them every day somewhere in the city. And we monitored them. Uh, when I say police, sometimes it's just an, uh, somebody in plain clothes monitoring, making sure everybody is safe. We had one real large one, I think it was June 1st, there were seven or 8,000 people uh, in our city. And it was peaceful for the most part. And um, after going uh, a couple of hours, uh, it got to the point where we asked, we started getting uh, rocks and bottles and fireworks thrown at police officers. So that's the point where we're gonna declare an unlawful assembly and ask folks to leave, which about 98% of them did um, peacefully. And uh, there was only a couple hundred left and they were there for one reason. Um, and that was just to destroy property and, and possibly injure people and, and wreak havoc. Uh, we call them rioters, not protesters or people exercising their First Amendment right. And that's when you see um, where there's force use sometimes if they're going, like I said, at, at no time am I ever gonna tell my officers to, well, you can take a couple rocks before we do everything or you can take uh, commercial grade fireworks as long as you don't catch on fire when they shoot them at you with obviously we're not going to do that but we will make every attempt possible to have them peacefully disassemble and leave um, before we get to that point <clears throat> as far as the federal part and I only watched on TV uh, the things that happened in Portland and other parts uh, of the country um, I, I think um, and like I said I, I wasn't there and I, I don't think I would want to be the police chief in Portland during that time but I don't, if you don't have the, uh, uh, the backing of the leadership of your city, um, I think that's when things start to, uh, to cave in on you and to the point where um, a federal agency of some sort has to come in and assist with the enforcement of, of um, protests that are going on up to, I think it was almost 150, 200 days straight. <clears throat> so I can't really speak to the efforts as far as what happened in those cities when the feds came in um, uh, as far as them not allowing folks to exercise their first amendment right i can only speak from at a local level if it gets to the point where they're um, destroying property and um, inflicting injury on police officers or other people then they, we're going to uh, respond accordingly jack or other panelists like to weigh in on this one sure um This, um, this tendency on the part of some of our community members to seemingly enjoy authoritarian acts um, gives me great worry. Um, the, the chief of police is right. The police need to be able to protect property and, and personal integrity. Um, but I think those, those sorts of actions are are easily tolerated, <clears throat> excuse me, in a free society. <clears throat> the, this concept of authoritarianism, this, this um, concept that I am going to um, force you or bludgeon you into compliance if you do not, not act in a way that I consider to be fill in the blank, um, patriotic, honest, whatever it might be. That's of, of real concern, and I, I and just as one community member, there seems to be a great deal more tolerance now for authoritarian activity than I I certainly was present when I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s, and I'll and I'll use I think there was an obvious example um, in Washington D.C. when our our current president decided to clear away peaceful protesters in order to stand in front of the church, a church with a Bible. Um, those people had a right to lawfully assemble. Um, and the idea that um, a member of our government would do that is of great concern. What's of more concern to me is that the, the national conscience did not seem to be outraged by that. And I, and I saw a, a small example here locally as to why I shouldn't have been surprised. And, and I might get my facts a bit wrong, but as I recall, several years ago at a Lakers game, a gentleman refused to stand up when the national anthem was played. And two um, 
members of the crowd, um, I believe it was two young women, threw their soda at him and, and demanded that he stand for the Pledge of Allegiance or for the national anthem. And it turned out that, the, if my facts are correct, the two young women were local at a local private university. And I found it terrifying that a person who decided, um, for whatever reason, to not engage in a ritual that we've all agreed upon that shows our our commitment to con to concepts of the pro of the Constitution, including the right to peaceful protest, that they would be physically assaulted. Um, you can say you're free because we have the ability to walk unrestrained to work, but we're not in a free society if we're threatened to be set aside, set upon by a mob. And I think that we need again, to go back to that concept of when did we lose the power to be able to speak to each other and to understand why you're doing what you're doing and can I convince you through my use of reason and logic and maybe even passion that you, we should all as a community come together. But in my view, that throwing of the soda was a budding authoritarian ideal because the idea was you don't you don't do what I want you to do or you don't do what I think is patriotic 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 I will take physical action against you. Um, a, a democracy can be lost. Um, it's happened in the past, and so um, I think that we need, again, to start talking to each other as community members rather than simply judging each other on social media. Yeah. Other panelists on First Amendment rights? Well, you know, I, I think everything that Jack said is, is, is spot on. And, and I think you can't underscore it enough to say that, you know, our democracy is really fragile. And so anytime you talk about authoritarian actions and jeopardizing First Amendment rights, I think it's pretty obvious that that's a threat to democracy and the constitution. So I'm definitely not a, an expert on this topic. I'm sure everyone on this panel and in the audience um, you know, feels the same way, but uh, I think that can't be underscored enough that you know, we all need to um, be really mindful and vigilant um, about the fragility of, of democracy. Michelle? And I, um, Jack had mentioned Washington, D.C., you know, I'm fortunate to be here or not fortunate, I don't know which is the way, um, but during, you know, uh, this this year, um, and I think uh, folks who may recall um, where these protests occurred near the White House and on Lafayette Square, um, that there is this historic um, uh, site called uh, the Decanter House, which is right next to the White House, and um, it is associated with um, where slaves um, worked and lived. Um, and it was um, vandalized during the protests. Um, vandalize is a term some people use, but there was, you know, there was graffiti on it, written on it, but it asked, actually there was a very poignant question of like, why save this place, right? Um, and uh, right away, the foundation that was managing it, you know, they, they chose to, um, to clean up um, the graffiti on there, the marking on the wall. But I think it begged a larger question. I know folks has then start to question, you know, we can clean it up, but I think that the question that was literally written on it, and we don't know the person who the, you know, who wrote it, if they actually knew what building they were writing on, right? Um, that it was a historic landmark um, associated with slavery, right? Um, but that it actually begs these questions of these historic sites that are really complicated of like, how do you, how do you practice your First Amendment rights? Um, and how these places actually, these historic places we, we try to save actually can be um, places of engagement that activate discussion. And it activated discussion in the field of historic preservation of like, how do you save this? How do you save even this moment of this historic site, the, the, the writing on the wall, literally. Um, and so I think that we think about this too, of just like, can these, these historic sites actually activate these conversations 
of um, enforcement of First Amendment rights and our civil liberties. And I think that's something that the Harada House has that ability to do um, in Riverside. Um, it could be, you know, and I'm, I, I was, I'm not around um, the city of Riverside during this time, but if it's a place of where there is protest, peaceful protest, can it also be a moment where people can then, we can talk about the Harada House um, in this time? Right? Um, can it be a, a, a landing pad to, to, to peacefully have these discussions? So that segues directly into the next question, which is how the Harada narrative can inform our efforts today. And, you know, would you be willing to comment on what's happening now socially and how it relates to a civil liberties landmark such as Harada House? Um, I mean, you know, again, it's it's a moment where we see uh, history is repeating itself um, and that we can learn from history, right? We can take the lessons of the Harada House, have active discussions, um, you know, and I mean, this is a moment for like, the, you know, with the rehabilitation, you know, with the Save America's Treasures Grant, you know, like we can talk about it as a way of saying like, the, the fight to, to preserve these places still continue, right? Even if the landmark designation happened, you know, more than a decade ago, but the place is still, I mean, at risk, right? Um, in terms of its integrity, but it's also, you know, but the, the story of the Harada family um, will always be associated with that place. Um, can we start to, you know, revisit these conversations, not only at the Harada house, we're seeing it across the nation, we're seeing at African American uh, civil rights sites, right? We're seeing it at, at Native American indigenous sites. We're seeing it in many sites across the country. We're seeing it at Stonewall, where these are places that that um, can um, take us back to a historical moment um, to teach us about when our civil liberties were threatened, or you know, um, there was these enforcements placed upon certain peoples. Um, and how there, you know, we fought for not only our civil liberties, but, you know, as part of a larger movement now that we can call, you know, social justice, um, that these small moments in history now have uh, come together, you know, in this year of, you know, as people have called this reckoning, right? Um, it's not just one moment, one place. It's, it's dozens, hundreds of places that share this common history um, of injustice. Kristen, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yeah, it's echoing a lot of what Michelle said. I mean, the story of the Harada House, I think, brings to light this long history of, of systemic inequity, but also resilience, you know, and I think the work of racial justice might be getting renewed today, but I think the story of the Harada House underscores that these efforts really are not new. And I think the Harada family's story is so relatable. You know, I mean, wanting to make a better life for your family is universal. And so I think that translates, you know, um, a long way and learning that immigrants who did not have the rights to the protections of citizens, um, you know, face discrimination, but had the courage um, and the audacity to fight unjust laws is really powerful. And I am sure a lot of people can relate today and, um, you know, hopefully the story of the Haradas um, inspires others to just ensure that, you know, everyone has equal protection under the law. So I think it's important to underscore this civil liberties success story. Um, and, you know, when you walk down Lemon Street today, I think you, um, you see that it's this welcoming and, and really diverse street in a diverse neighborhood. And that wasn't always the case. So I think it's really important um, to tell the Harada story and, um, and you know, to make this history known. Could I, could I add one thing? Sure, go ahead. If we have time. Have. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said and I, I would like to try to tie this question to the first question which dealt with our existing systems. And I, and I have a, a part of the um, judgment of the court in the Harada case here and the court said, doubtless, many of the neighboring residents, as well as others, object to the presence of the Haradas as neighbors, but that is not sufficient reason for depriving these children of their property. The law is not sufficiently broad to deny the right of, excuse me, the right to own land to the American born children of aliens, and that's the language of the court, that's not my language, ineligible to citizenship. The law must be enforced that is written 
and its terms may not be enlarged by the courts to include others than those mentioned in the statute itself. And, and the reason I, I quote that is, um, one of the mechanisms, not the only one, by which we've held ourselves accountable is through our efforts to use reason and um, judgment through our court system. The courts are a reflection of an, of an enlightened mind that, that will look to evidence, will look to facts. And, and one of the things that I think as a community we have to realign is where are we going to reliably go to at least try to get a common sense of facts that we can use in discussing our problems. So from my perspective, cases like the Barada case remind me that our entire system as it was written was viable it will not remain viable if we continue to um, rely our worst instincts, our worst, op our, our most base um, opinions about people, about things that have nothing to do, things like your national origin, um, that have nothing to do with being a good human being. If, if, we, can, if we can realign ourselves, hopefully cure the, um, the eroding press, the eroding media, so that it's reliable enough to get us a collective set of facts and be willing to be vulnerable enough to engage ourselves in real conversation. I think that's something we can learn from that case. Thank you. I will ask each of you to address the final question before we go to our audience Q&A. And that question is, what actions can each of us undertake to move away from repeating the errors of the past. Um, I can do kind of an easy lift. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, given the topic at hand tonight is um, supporting the Harada House. You know, uh, we talked about the Save America's Treasures grant that requires a match, right? Um, and it's, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, $500,000 that needs to be matched at minimum. And I think, you know, that money, it's not only about rehabilitating the building, right? But as you see in some of the uh, Q&A of like, how can we visit these places if they're virtual? How can we support uh, protecting it, right? From potential, um, you know, vandalism or other crimes in the neighborhood, right? And so raising money is about also, you know, um, helping protect the place literally, but also to hopefully um, get more um, community participation in doing like oral histories and, and you know, sharing their stories and seeing way much more of um, the Harada House and, you know, other uh, related stories be told and preserved, right? Um, and so one quick way, I mean, you know, this is me, I guess my professional hat on is, you know, we can, we can donate, we can not only donate monetarily, we can donate our time, we can support causes um, like the Harada House um, um, that, you know, the, the museum and the foundation are working on. Um, and, and not only for the Harada House, but how do we support this kind of work that, you know, uh, tell the story of our civil liberties, right? Um, there, are, there are dozens, if not hundreds of other places across the country that have similar um, needs and that have similar stories. Thank you. Other panelists on what actions we can take? I guess I can jump in real quick. I, so uh, <clears throat> to move away from repeating errors in the past is something in law enforcement we have to do every single day. And that's just learning from our mistakes. <clears throat> and it's not as simple as I, I brought this up earlier, uh, that, you know, We've developed all kinds of training and things. I, I get it. We can't just say we're going to send all of our officers to a 20 hour training and we're good. We, we, we understand that is not the case at all. It has to be measurable. And for me, the big push I have with, with our officers is, and uh, Michelle just kind of touched on it, is engaging with our community more. Not just the upper level folks that have to go to certain meetings and are there, but our young patrol officers. So, you know, they, they, they should have, we, we, something we can implement in our training is learning more about the history of our community because I, I do get defensive every once in a while when 
people uh, do the national narrative on law enforcement. And, I'm, and I want to say, well, we're not Minneapolis. We're not uh, Portland. We're not whatever. But I'm not saying we're good. We got this. We've been through this before. But I'm saying we, every community is different. So uh, it's important for me to have our officers engage with the culture and our community. And that goes from the beat officer level. The officer that's responding to calls in a black and white police car right now, um, uh, I've challenged them to go out there and make those, make, make those contacts. Not just if you're in a special assignment or you're on the problem oriented policing team or the community outreach team, but the everyday police officer to engage the community on a daily basis. Because, and it, it, it's just like for us, and I, I, I use this as an example, when you're in training at the Riverside Police Department, we take you to every location um, in your training program where an officer was killed in line of duty. We've had 16 here in the city of Riverside and they go to every site and they hear the story. And, and it's important to our field training officers to give them that history. So having them understand that, just think about different aspects or different parts of our community where those things are just as important to them as well. Understand that, get to know that. And uh, another thing that was said is, is, is history repeats itself. I hope it doesn't repeat itself on some things that have happened to Riverside PD in the past. Um, I know what I learned um, years ago, uh, I went to the FBI National Academy and it was 275 people in the class, 29 different countries represented. And I found out really quick that everybody has the same problems in the world. It's, it's people problems. And one of the interesting classes I had was, it was like a historical ethics type class. And every day there'd be a new quote on the board. And you had to guess what year or what era it came from. And, you know, we would say the seventies or the sixties, and it was, it was a quote by Socrates. You know, it was stuff that you're thinking, wow, they had, they dealt with the same type of issues that, that we're dealing with, you know, hundreds of years later. Um, but it puts everything in perspective. So, for me, just wrapping it all up is, is, is engaging our community and understanding the different cultures throughout the community and, um, you know, the struggles they've been through and the things and even the struggles with the police department specifically. You know, we have to understand that there's some history when you work the east side. There's some history when you work this area. Officers were killed there. There was a bad, there was bad sentiment towards that community going both ways. So a young cop who's 21 years old who doesn't even know what the Taisha Miller incident was because they weren't born yet. Uh, they, it's important for us to make sure we educate them so they have a better understanding of our community and the community that they serve. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Jack. I was going to say, well, I'll just um, use what the chief said as a, um, as a push off place. He, he said it in order to avoid repeating the errors of the past. We have to know what the errors of the past what, were and um, how we got there and why we got there. Um, we seem to go in cycles. And so uh, he, he make, I, I'll, I won't go on. I, the chief made a very good point. If, um, if young police officers um, weren't aware of the East Side shooting back in the, what was it, the 1970s over by Boardwell Park, um, and if they're not aware of the shooting of Taisha Miller um, in 1998, um, then they're, they're walking out into a community they don't know, and they're going to un unknowingly do the same damn things that got us in trouble in the first place. Thank you. Kristen, you have a, a comment on not repeating the errors of the past. Yeah, I mean, besides, you know, some of the obvious things I think would be to have empathy, to be empathetic, um, to stay informed about history and the contemporary moment, and and I think about how at the Japanese American National Museum, we show what happens when the constitution is suspended and there's a failure of political leadership and what happens when there's racism. And, you know, we tell that story to try to um, develop appreciation for America's cultural and, and ethnic diversity, you know, as a way to inform people and, and to help them to understand, you know, the, the errors of the past um, and how, um, and, and to make the story relatable so that, you know, we can all do our part um, to ensure civil liberties for all. And I know there's so many other, you know, institutions um, and grassroots organizations that are doing that. So I agree with Michelle, you know, to support um, these grassroots efforts and to support the Harada House and, and the work that the, um, the Riverside Museum is doing because you're helping to, to build empathy and to, and to help um, um, people be informed about the past and, and make connections to the present. So I think all those things could really make a difference. 
And I also want to just uh, say one more thing in the sense of there are a lot of, not a lot, but I mean, you know, relatively speaking, there are um, many great historic sites in Riverside and in um, the inland region to really take, you know, um, to look at and to understand our histories, particularly in the region, which, you know, oftentimes it can be seen as monolithic or very dichotomous of a black and white or, or white and other kind of history of tension. Um, and I think it's really, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of layers to the region that we should really recognize um, that it's not only informing our history of the region but of the nation um, you know even of the history of um, of violence you know in the region um, really speaks to and tells us about what has happened in the past and and how can we learn from those moments right not just the celebratory moments but the really traumatic moments too Right, it's important to to look at at at, at all these um, complicated um, historical moments um, in the region. Um, but that also, it's just I think this for me to say coming leaving the region and coming here to D.C. People don't think that there's anything to learn historically from Riverside and the region. And I often push back and say there's so much to learn. I think there's actually a lot of amazing places to visit and, and, and you know, um, people don't see, um, just for instance, the, the California State, um, the Citrus Historic Park, you know, um, the importance of places like that to tell so many of our stories, um, and, you know, and that there's a lot of great work, there's a lot of good organizations and individuals who've been putting in a lot of really good work, not just recently, but, you know, um, for decades. And so I think that's something to really celebrate is the importance of like um, community engagement and community driven kind of work um, and not only in historic preservation but like even public history. Thank you and, and thank you all. We've come to the end of our questions that you've considered in advance and it looks like we have quite a few questions on the Q&A so I'm going to pass the baton to Lauren and have her set those questions before you. Thank you very much. It's certainly been a very stimulating uh, conversation and it's apparent from the questions how engaged the audience has been. Um, I'd like to start off with a question from Mark Rowich. Uh, Kristen uh, showed us his, uh, his book earlier. Um, he, he writes, if a family different from my own moved next door to my family, what would each panelist suggest I say to my 10 year old about sharing our neighborhood with new neighbors who may not have the same background or beliefs as our family? This could be addressed to anybody. I, I, would, I would tell the, um, I would say to the child, hey, let's go um, say hi and find out what we can learn from them. I think my parents taught me the same. <laughs> if someone, a new neighbor comes in, you come over, you, you go over and say hello and, you know, usually have something like a, you know, a gift in hand just to say hello and to welcome them. Um, and I think, you know, uh, coming from my background, you know, of my parents were immigrants from the Philippines of just like being different was um, more the norm um, than, you know, abnormal in our experiences. And so I think it's again, reaching out um, and, and showing an act of empathy and, and generosity of welcoming them in. Um, I, to me, difference, I don't know if I would, I think difference is just kind of, to me become very normal. <laughs> It'd be, it, we would be delighted if it was someone like me, because, you know, you get excited, but I think difference has become very normal for, for my lived experience. I, I agree with what the other two panelists said, and I, the, the key thing I took out of this is the parent is asking. So if the parent initiates the contact or, or brings the kid over, you do what your parents do. So it's just great to hear that the parents are involved with that, because that isn't always the case. And at that age, at a very young age, I know I have three children, they're grown now, but at that age, I think the only thing they hated was taking a nap. Um, other than that, they didn't, it wasn't, had nothing to do with anybody else. And I, 
I think it's important to engage them, but I think uh, the parent leading by example is, is a key factor as well. I agree with what everyone has said. I think um, food is a really great way, I think, to explore um, a, a new friendship and, and just thinking about, you know, when, when I was young, our neighbors um, introduced Chinese New Year foods to us and, and that was just a way for us to learn, you know, more about uh, different culture um, and, and to get to know them and, and a relationship formed from that. So I think it is really important, as everyone says, to, you know, to engage um, with your neighbors and, and form a relationship. Very good. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so I hope uh, some of you will forgive me if I don't ask uh, every question. Um, here's one from Eugene Moy. Could the speakers comment on how to address racial profiling um, or bias in officer education in K through 12 and higher education and in public recognition of our diverse American history? And uh, I think Katie, did you want to uh, say something or someone else about education? No. Perhaps others want to comment on it. Um, I need to get clarification. Are they looking about racial bias in 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 K twelve education or several several types? They begin with officer education in K K through twelve and in higher education and in public recognition of our diverse American history, all across the board, I'd say. Mm. Um, well, I, I, I do a good deal of work um, with school districts in the region. And um, I, can, I can say that a number of districts um, have become very um, proactive in trying to create um, create spaces of, in education where um, racial diversity is, is at once recognized, but is attempted to be um, not made to be a barrier to personal interaction and certainly to learning. Um, I could go on about this for some time and, and I won't, but I will say this, one of the, one of the things uh, I had an experience that happened um, this past summer as a result of um, an investigation a partner and I, I were doing about possible um, racially, discriminated, discri racially discriminatory behavior um, on, a, on a school campus. And in doing so, one of the um, interviewees said something that, that really struck me. And, and it was a person of color. And he said, the people in the school just don't get it. Uh, we keep trying to tell them there are problems um, that we, we we're trying to fix and we want them as adults to help us fix. And they keep telling us things like, you know, well, we're colorblind around here. And what they don't understand is when they tell me, because I'm the person happened to be African American, I'm black, that they don't see color. What they're really saying to me is they don't see me. And so um, I think um, now is a time, and it kind of goes back to the first question, where some of our institutions, like K-12 school districts, like universities, like community college districts, have a unique opportunity to engage in real conversation to try to get to real understanding and not rely upon platitudes. I, I agree with Jack um, in terms of um, the field of historic preservation, there is implicit bias in historic preservation. It's obvious when I give the numbers that, you know, uh, the lack of representation on the um, federal level, which trickles down, right? And we hear time and time again, you know, um, I don't think, um, well, traditionally historic preservation is occupied by both black, uh, white uh, men and women, right? Um, and, and it's often the, you know, I, I'm a, I always hear this question of like, why aren't there Filipino American historic sites? You know, are you guys not saving it? Um, is it not important to you? I mean, that, that's, that's obvious implicit bias. Like you assume that like, we don't care and that we are like, we're just ignorant um, versus looking at structural um, forces that shaped our experiences, right? Um, and how 
we have lived, worked, and resided, you know, in these built environments. Um, and so, you know, that's implicit bias that even in the field of historic preservation, when they ask, like, you know, oh, is it because Black, Indigenous, and people of color don't care about their places and they don't care about their histories, right? Um, and, and, you know, that just, you know, hits to the core of just like, no, you know, we know, I mean, just like the Harada house is a key example um, that people don't see it, right? Um, they don't, it seems so ordinary and, um, but to, to so many of us, it's an extraordinary story, right? Um, that has been stifled, that has been um, made invisible in many ways, right? Um, you know, the, the, the systems that be in the past may have not, you know, um, supported, you know, funding for it or, you know, um, public education on it. Um, and so, you know, there is an implicit bias that it sees that these places don't matter or they're not worthy of funding, they're not worthy of recognition, they're not worthy of attention, they're not worthy of even being as they see here in some of the q and It's not, there is the Harada House in the stories or in the history books in, for Riverside Unified School District, right? Is it a place that the students go to um, when they go to the Mission Inn? right? Um, is it required in education, um, public education in Riverside, or not even just for K through 12, but, you know, for, you know, in, um, we're seeing the Chamber of Commerce. Do they learn about it? Does the law enforcement learn about, you know, the history of, of the violation of civil liberties in the city, right? Is it in our curriculum, whatever industry or profession we may be? Um, and it's very obvious, even in the field of historic uh, preservation, that there is implicit bias and, um, and particularly in this year, there has been um, this reckoning, you know, to, to, to call that out. Right. Um, let me go on to another question. There are so many important ones here. Uh, given the goal, uh, the aspirational goals for the Harada House, what models can we emulate? What historical landmark in a medium-sized city has succeeded in strengthening civic engagement and creating racial justice? Well, I'll give another plug for the Japanese American National Museum, which um, started or was founded in 1992 in um, a historic building. It was the former, formerly the Nishi Hongonji Buddhist Temple. Um, and uh, so it's this historic building and, you know, we use it all the time to talk about um, the neighborhood and, and, and the story of um, Japanese American incarceration. And, you know, the site itself was um, uh, a place where Japanese Americans in the neighborhood had to report where they, you know, that's where they gathered and were forcibly removed, um, you know, from and taken to detention centers. And so we say that that site um, is a site of conscience. Um, and so I, in some ways I, I do see like similarities between the Nishi Honganji building, which is part of Janum, and also the Harada House, how it could be used as this, you know, center for interpretation. And, and also, you know, again, a reminder that of the power of place and how um, place matters. And there are places that are designated like sites of consciousness um, that are associated so you can, I don't know the official name, but if you Google like sites of consciousness and historic sites, it'll come up. And so, you know, there are places like Harada House, um, Angel Island in San Francisco, um, you know, um, many African-American civil rights uh, historic places, you know, those will come up. And I think um, there's actually quite a, you know, several, I, I'm trying to think medium sized city that I'm not, um, I just don't have, it's, it's like 10, almost 1030 my time. So I'm like, I can't, my brain is malfunctioning right now um, <laughs> with all this data that I'm just like, oh, there's so many, but I can't think of them right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, even just going to the National Trust um, for Historic Preservation, they have their African-American civil rights um, network um, that highlights places like this associated with um, African-American civil rights sites. Um, there's even the National Park Service has it as well. So um, there are several places, you know, um, that are officially designated and there's those who are not um, bringing to mind uh, for me personally, I know the Little Manila Historic Site in Stockton, Stockton and Riverside have shared many um, 
similar histories and demographics and in, in, in size and also part of inland California. Um, but they are not designated, um, you know, uh, on the national level, but they continue to fight um, based on issues of social justice in that, um, in that neighborhood and for the Filipino American uh, history of that of the city of Stockton um, and that it's become even bigger, not just about historic preservation, but fighting for equity and justice, um, environmental justice and tying it into other justice movements. Um, and even about civic engagement um, as you know, younger folks are getting now involved, uh, you know, going through an after school program in Little Manila and now, you know, see one of the alumni who's now sits on the board of education um, you know, the mayor is su supportive of the work and, and people are getting civically engaged um, based on this place, this history. Um, and so I think that's something that, you know, not only looking at the designated places, but there's other places that are unfortunately are, haven't been able to get designated yet, but uh, really um, our, their core is on social justice and civil liberties. I'll go on to another question. Um, this is uh, from Leah uh, Leimacher. Um, is it possible to remove those who cross the line into violence without declaring the entire protest an unlawful assembly and thereby preventing protesters from continuing to exercise their First Amendment rights without violence? I think that one's for me. I, I think so. <laughs> and, and the answer is yes. Uh, like I said, when, it, depending on how large the protest is, like I said, our, our one goal is to make sure folks are safe to ex safely exercise their First Amendment right. And just give you an example. I told you how we've had daily protests since May. And um, we've made seven arrests the entire time, and they were all in one night. It was the one night. That, so we we try very hard to make sure that people can peacefully protest. And I can think of one, um, you know, years ago, they, they actually had the, the Nazis, the National Socialist Movement came to Riverside. And I tell you what, there's only 15 of them, but they bring a lot of counter protesters with them. So for the 15, we had about 5,000 counter protesters. And um, within the first one minute, um, people overcame barricades and it got violent. Uh, we were able to make a few arrests and try to, they, they, were, they would listen to us after because their whole thing was in, no matter what you believe about what, whatever group is protesting, they have the right to exercise their First Amendment right. We were able to calm the crowd down in that case where they were able to do their thing for however long they did and they left. If we have a situation where we continually are getting assaulted or getting uh, things thrown at us, um, then then there's there's it, we'll have to clear an unlawful assembly and not be able to uh, have anybody stay there because it just, if they're not listening, it, how do you choose who stays? We, we identified people that are, that are actually the ones throwing stuff or lighting off fireworks. And uh, for the one or two that we might arrest, there could be 10 others with him or her that uh, come out of the woodwork afterwards. So tactically and for officer safety, uh, when it gets to where we can't control it anymore and people can't peacefully protest, unfortunately, we have to clear, declare an unlawful assembly and have everybody leave. But there are small examples where you might have one bad actor in there that we're able to get out of the crowd, which has happened sometimes. They throw something. Uh, nobody else wanted the person there. He shows up. There's a couple hundred people there. We're able to remove that person. And yes, we will make sure that they continually can protest whatever the group is uh, for that day. I hope that answers it. Yes. Thank you. I, have a, um, I, I think we're, we're running, running a low on time, but I just, there are just a couple more I wanted to make sure you all had a chance to respond to. This is from Rose Mange. Education is key for change. I knew nothing about the Harada House, the Community Settlement Association, or the influence of the Chinese in Riverside until I was an adult. I'm a product of the uh, Riverside Unified School District. Local history needs to be embedded in civics classes. How can the museum address this for our youth? I think Robin, this is you. It's absolutely our intention to uh, develop more formal relationships with the school districts, which will uh, be amplified as we get closer to reopening our main site. 
um, we were a bit dismayed to find out that the, uh, the recent uh, legislative proposal to integrate ethnic studies uh, was not signed by the governor and um, hopefully whatever adjustments are necessary to that legislation will eventually get it passed so that ethnic studies do become part of uh, curriculum. Right now, uh, what we're able to do is less formal, less embedded in curriculum based while we remain closed and remain site, but certainly it's museums and historic sites that can help to fill that gap insofar as it's not mandated through federal or state curriculum standards. Okay, thank you. And then uh, maybe just as a last question, this is from Nathan Elst Elstrand. How can we as members of the public engage with and amplify the Harada story? I'm particularly thinking about the Center for Social Justice and Civil Liberties, which highlights the family's legacy. I'll go ahead and address that one again too. Yes. Um, the, the effort to rehabilitate and open the house to the public is the museum's uh, central activity right now with regard to Harada House, but there are also other ways to make sure that the story is known, which will in turn help the effort to rehabilitate the house. And this is something that anyone who gains some knowledge of the story can help us with. Just talking about it, sharing that this second National Historic Landmark exists in Riverside. Um, take your friends, family, your out of town visitors, buy it, take a look at it. Uh, you don't have to know the story in full to help tell it to others and make sure that people understand that something remarkable occurred here over a century ago. So you don't, again, you don't have to be a specialist, you don't have to have any formal affiliation to historic preservation or any other aspect of our, our the story, but you can still help to make sure that there's a greater awareness built of it. Um, the partnerships that we have with the other cultural organizations in town will only grow, particularly as, we, again, we get closer to reopening, including the Center for Social Justice and Civil Liberties uh, and the New Civil Rights Institute. All these organizations um, have related missions to what we will be, the, the histories that we'll be telling of this area. Um, you can follow our pretty, our very active Facebook um, posts on it, share these little tidbits, very humanizing little tidbits about the history. And again, um, this, the Harada House story is not the only story in our area that can be shared in this way. Uh, there are many other remarkable uh, moments in Riverside's history, delve into just a little bit and share them with those you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to turn it over to back to Robin. Thank you. Well, I want to thank um, all the panelists. And if any of you has a final remark you would like to make, this would be your moment to do it. Well, Robin, I actually wanted to answer the last question, too, in the sense of um, I bring up uh, Stockton. Um, but, you know, I think there's been questions of like, how can we do more public awareness and even K through 12 education um, and in the city of Stockton that they fought based on Little Manila historic site, they fought for um, an ethnic studies um, requirement in their K through 12. Um, that also includes histories um, of, you know, historic sites in Stockton, right, um, and then they even then took it to Sacramento. Um, to, you know, pass um, through State Assembly member Rob Bonta, AB 123, very easy legislation to remember, um, that required the, um, the history of Filipino American farm labor movement um, to be required curriculum across the state of California, right? And so can you imagine when these historic sites become these places of active learning and teaching to the point where it becomes now required curriculum in a school district or even across state, you know, across the state of California, 
um, it's very powerful to see these places um, activate even public education and even how do you, you know, when we, when we can um, complain about, we don't learn about these things in our books, um, we can then take that next step and actually make sure that they're included in the books, they're included in the curriculum, they're included in, you know, field trips to the museum and its affiliates, right? And then also that's a way to just engage other levels of education and engagement. Very good point, thank you. Um, I regret that we weren't able to get to all of the questions that were, uh, that were submitted on the Q&A, but um, very pleased that there's so many of them. Thank you all for participating. Thank our panelists and all of our audience members. Uh, please uh, keep an eye on HaradaHouseFoundation.org and uh, the museum's website as we develop more programs like this one. And Katie, would you like to say anything on behalf of Inlandia? Sure. So thank you all for being here tonight. This was really an enriching and educational discussion. Um, I encourage you, if you enjoyed this, to please like or follow the Harada House Foundation social media pages, as well as Inlandia and the Museum of Riverside. And as I believe it was mentioned um, earlier, that there is some uh, wonderful news regarding a grant in the amount of a, a half a million dollars, but it is a matching grant for the Harada House. So if you um, are so inclined, please do uh, seek out their website. And I would like to go ahead and put that up on the screen for you so that you can the, whoops, wrong direction, how you can donate. And if um, you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or uh, Robin Peterson. And at this time, I just thank you for being here. And thank you, Robin, for a wonderful discussion. And Larry and Michelle and Kristen and Jack. And we are um, just so grateful to have you all here tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I think we will adjourn and uh, we will see you again in uh, another time. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night.